Okay. So we're in a car in Selma, driving back from Jubilee. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful moment for us. Absolutely. We've been changed spiritually. We're thinking about the future. We're thinking about the work we're doing to fight for truth and justice in America. And we start talking. And you're moved. You are moved, man. You are ready to go. By the young people uh, with the Institute for Common Power. Okay. So bringing young people to Selma, to the site of the movement, to be inspired by the foot soldiers, of the movement, to learn from those young people who in that moment when they saw injustice took action. That's exactly right. And that's what we do. That's, that's what, what we, we do. do. That's what Common Power does. That's, that's, what do. that's what we do. So we are, thank you all for joining us. My name is Dr. Terry Ann Scott. I am the director of the Institute for Common Power. I am joined by two colleagues. I'm Charles Douglas. I'm the executive director of Common Power. And I'm Yuhu Williams, uh, a We the People fellow at the Institute for Common Power and professor of history at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's also the one in that car who said, I know what we should do. Mm -hmm. We should do a 24-hour teaching. Yeah, I thought specifically we needed to not only do a teaching, not only spend that time, 24 hours, talking about the lessons that are being denied young people across the country in terms of the curriculum, but also draw attention to what's happening in states like Florida and Virginia and Ohio, where there's an active pushback against the teaching of African-American history, which we know is essential to civic engagement and activism. Exactly. And so you said, I know some people in Florida. <laughs> I did. I, I, I knew Pastor Williams here and the incredible, yes. uh, this incredible community here in Dallas County, spe specifically St. Petersburg. And we're happy to be here. They opened their doors to us, welcomed, welcomed us, and here we are. And we're here to make a statement for the next 24 hours about what it means to stand up for democracy and democratic practice. And it falls into what we do and the kind of work that we do at the Institute for Common Power and at Common Power. Common Power itself is a voting justice organization. The Institute for Common Power is the educational branch of that. We go to the places that need help. That's why we were together in Selma. We invest in Selma, we invest in the people. We make sure that we don't just go to these places as tourists and visit, we do the work. And that's why we are physically here in St. Petersburg, Florida right now. Because if you've been seeing anything on the news, you have seen the kinds of restrictive policies that are coming out of this state that are aimed at marginalizing certain groups of youth, that are aimed at restricting the teaching of truth in this state, and we fear that those local policies will become nationalized. We are here to expose what's happening. We are here to catalyze people and help them understand the power that they have to vote. That's right. And, and this is why Dr. Terry Ann Scott runs the Institute for Common Power, because she is a powerhouse herself. You've got a letter that you're going to read for us here in a moment. We have a lot in store for you today. Again, Pastor Williams, thank you so much for hosting us here. Thank you to this congregation for being here with us. Um, I don't expect you all to be here for 24 hours. She wants to. <laughs> she wants to. We will be here for 24 hours in part. We got folks here in Florida. We have folks back home in Seattle. We have people all over the country watching this right now who will be in and out with us. Get ready for a ride. We're going to learn about some, some real truth here in America. And we're going to learn about ways to take action. So you're going to see all three of us throughout these 24 hours. We have incredible hosts who will be joining us at the end of this conversation. Pastor Williams, who has welcomed us into his space, will be speaking shortly, as will Dr. Leon, Dr. Wilmer Leon. So before we get to those things and before Dr. Yuhuru Williams introduces them, we have drafted a letter that is an open letter to Governor DeSantis because we invite you, Governor DeSantis, to come and sit with us and learn from us and have a dialogue as well. Learn from the many educators who will be coming from across the country, both in person and virtually over the next 24 hours to teach us and activate us. So I'm going to read that letter. Dear Governor Ron DeSantis, I write today as the director of the Institute for Common Power, a nonpartisan educational organization dedicated to fostering, sustaining, and expanding what should be the most common power in American democracy, the right to vote. I am also a former professor of African American history and chair of the Department of History at Hood College. We at the Institute for Common Power, together with a growing body of educators, activists, parents, citizens, and voters, are gravely concerned about the archaic and discriminatory policies that Florida leaders are implementing and promoting to eliminate truth in education and to intimidate and stoke fear among educators. These actions are in direct contradiction to a fair, open, honest, and democratic America. 
Out of concern for our nation and democracy, we are holding this 24 hour teaching for truth and American democracy here in Florida to bring national and international attention to the Florida-based attack on truth in education. We have chosen this date, May 17th, because it is the anniversary of the foundational pillar and the commitment of an American democracy built for all, the Brown versus Board of Education U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 1954. We are hosting this teaching at the Greater Mount Zion a &E Church in St. Petersburg, Florida, and it starts at six and we end at six o'clock tomorrow. Dr. Yehuru Williams, Distinguished University Chair and Professor of History at St. Thomas University in Minnesota. Charles Douglas, Executive Director of Common Power. Dr. David Domke, Professor at Common Power. And I have planned this teaching in close co collaboration with Greater Mount Zion AME Church. Professors, primary and secondary school teachers, civil rights heroes, voting rights advocates, and others will participate over the next 24 hours. We see this as a necessary act to bring attention to the essential work of teaching truthful history in pursuit of a fair and just democracy. Florida leaders have banned the implementation of AP African-American studies in secondary schools. They have promoted an anti-woke agenda that eliminates the histories and experiences of millions of Americans. They seek to deny tenure to professors and state-funded institutions in an effort to suppress truth and tightly control a historical narrative that eliminates how white supremacy created structural inequalities. Educators are being fired, intimidated, and leaving their jobs for simply teaching factual history. These policies criminalize and demonize the teaching of truth in an effort to promote and codify an educational agenda defined by white supremacist ideals. It is an agenda that erases the contributions of women, people of color, and LGBTQ plus communities out of fear of a loss of power, as it messages to youth who are members of these targeted communities, they don't matter, they are not valued. These actions echo a Jim Crow era strategy that sought to maintain racial dominance. But we know, and the large majority of Americans know, that these antiquated ideas and discriminatory laws shall be defeated by righteousness and all who value truth over lies, justice over fear. Hate will falter before the strength of virtue and decency. We will speak in partnership with those in turmoil and fearful of losing their jobs. We will elevate the voices of the many suppressed by the few. We as educators, parents, citizens, voters are committed to teaching truth, to countering those who are trying to silence it, to supporting educators who stand for truth, and to partnering with organizations and leaders who are committed to combating efforts to erase truth from existence. Governor DeSantis, we will teach. We will do this for all before us who have done so, for all standing up now, and for all who will come for democracy. With sincerity, Terry Ann Scott. Hey, all right. I wanna remind everyone who is viewing online we want you to stay engaged. This will be streaming all night. That's very important. We have some incredible scholars coming in, community people coming in, but all that's for naught if you don't find a way to take action. We recognize in the lessons that we learned from the civil rights movement, things that we did on the ground with young people with the Institute for Common Power in Birmingham is that freedom is a constant struggle. And so we all have to make everyday commitments and practice acts of everyday democracy. Part of that is staying engaged and staying informed. And that's a lot of what you'll hear over the next 24 hours from some of the great speakers that we have coming in, including our first speaker this afternoon and also one of our hosts for the first 10 or 12 hours or so, Dr. Wilmer Leon. You know him as a radio personality, an incredible scholar, uh, uh, independent journalist, and a powerful voice for truth and justice in our community. Please join me in welp welcoming Dr. Wilmer Leon. Good evening, everyone. And Uhuru, thank you so much for, for that introduction. And uh, welcome and, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this evening for this very important, very important event. As Uhuru said, I am uh, Dr. Wilmer Leon, political scientist, <clears throat> excuse me, author and nationally uh, broadcast uh, talk show host. And I am one of the facilitators of this event this evening. 
America is an exceptional and indispensable nation, or that's at least what Americans continue to tell themselves and tell folks around the world. Uh, in his farewell address to the nation, President Reagan, former President Reagan, used the metaphor of the shining city on the hill. And Americans have been indoctrinated to believe that this country is on some type of special mission ordained by God to civilize the heathens and, to, and the savages and to spread democracy around the world, even if America feels that that has to be done at the barrel of a gun. One of the things that Americans have been convinced of, and they tout and they use this as one of the, the examples of why America is so exceptional, is its public school education system. According to a paper entitled History and the Evolution of Public Education in the US, it was written by the Center of Education Policy, they write, quote, the founding fathers maintained that the success of the fragile American democracy would depend on the competency of its citizens. They believed strongly that preserving democracy would require an educated population that could understand political and social issues and would participate in, civ in civic life, vote wisely, protect their rights and freedoms, and resist tyrants and demagogues. We're here today to, in one very, very small way, work to preserve and protect American democracy. We are here to protect the rights and freedoms of all Americans and resist the efforts, the machinations, the insidious plots and schemes by tyrants and demagogues to miseducate our children. Contrary to the dominant narrative, these tyrants and demagogues are not foreign actors trying to miseducate our children. It's not President Xi in China. It's not Putin in Russia. It's not Maduro in Venezuela. It's not the ghosts of Osama and Saddam. The tyrants and demagogues are actually domestic, born right here, homegrown in the good old U.S. of A. Here's a very recent example. NBC News reported Florida governor and 2024 Republican presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis signed into law just this past Monday a bill restricting how race and gender can be taught in Florida public higher education institutions and banning them from using state or federal funding for diversity programs. At a ceremony at the New College of Florida, in Sarasota, DeSantis signed three bills that he said, and these are his words, he said would give students sound fundamental skills and prevent people from imposing orthodoxies at public universities. Now this is NBC, not me. They say this marked an escalation of a broader conservative effort to limit the ways that schools can teach about issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Who is imposing the orthodoxy and what is the orthodoxy that is being imposed? By restricting how race and gender can be taught in Florida's public uh, higher education institutions, the governor is limiting access, the students' access to the information that they're going to need in order to assist them in broadening their, their perspectives, not only their personal perspectives, but their educational perspectives as well. By restricting how race and gender can be taught in Florida's uh, schools of higher education, you are imposing an orthodoxy of racism and white supremacy. In her seminal work, The ISIS Papers, The Keys to the Colors, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing 
defines racism, white supremacy, as the local and global power system, such as the DeSantis administration. Here in Florida, the Yunkin administration in Virginia and others that are structured and maintained by persons who classify themselves as white, whether consciously or subconsciously uh, determined, and that this system consists of patterns of perception, of logic, of symbol formation, of thought, speech, action, and emotional response as conducted and simultaneously uh, conducted in all areas of activity, including economics, education, law, et cetera. Governor DeSantis is leading what appears to be a national campaign to impose his white supremacist and anti-LGBTQ uh, narrative on the nation. Florida's Department of Education, under the direction of the governor, has banned students' access to AP courses on African-American studies. Why? Why would you do that? Because according to him, it's lessons delve too far, and this is, these are his words, delve too far into political agendas, broaching topics such as queer studies and abolishing prisons. Again, who is imposing the orthodoxy here? And what is the orthodoxy being imposed? In April of 2022, the governor signed into law what he branded as the Stop Woke Act, which restricts how race is discussed in schools, colleges, and workplaces. The law prohibits any teaching that could make students feel they bear personal responsibility for historic wrongs because of their race, their color, their sex, or national origin. Folks, if you can't discuss it, how can you fix it? Folks, white students should never feel personally responsible for the transgressions of their ancestors. But by understanding those transgressions, hopefully their understanding of humanity will compel them to actually bring to fruition the preamble of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You all are, are very familiar with that. Hopefully, their understanding of humanity would compel them to actually bring to fruition the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and so on into the night. Folks, unfortunately, what we are experiencing right now is not new. We have seen this movie too many times. In February of 1915, upon viewing the film, The Birth of a Nation, at a special White House screening, President Woodrow Wilson reportedly remarked, it's like writing history with lightning. My only regret is that it's all so terribly true. Remember Senator Richard Russell, the man whom the Russell Senate office, House uh, Office Building is named. He said this in 1935, quote, as one who was born and reared in the atmosphere of the Old South, with six generations of my forebearers now resting beneath Southern soil, I am willing to go so far and make as great a sacrifice to preserve white supremacy in the social, economic, and political life of our state as any man who lives within her borders. Senator Russell was willing to lay down his life for white supremacy. Governor Santis and his ilk seem to be channeling their inner Richard Russells. They have re-energized the Republican Southern strategy of race baiting. 
Then there's the great filibuster that we can never afford to forget. At precisely 8.54 p.m. on August 28, 1957, Senator Strom Thurmond began the longest filibuster in U.S. history. The filibuster was carried out for more than 24 hours. I think it was actually 24 hours and 16 minutes uh, to prevent the passage of the 1957 Civil Rights Act. A stand against a tide of history that was overwhelming the forces of racism and white supremacy that dominated the South and Southern lawmakers, as well as the U.S. Congress. We all remember the stand in the schoolhouse door that took place at Foster Auditorium in, uh, at the University of Alabama on June 11, 1963. George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, in a symbolic attempt to keep his inaugural promise. You all remember those famous words, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. In order to stop the desegregation of schools, uh, he stood at the door of the auditorium to block the entry of two African-American students, Vivian Malone and James Hood. These are just a few examples of the long racist history of America. This is the American history. This is not African-American history. This is the American history that DeSantis does not want the children of Florida, and if it's up to him, the children of the United States to learn and have to grapple with. He does not want them to know the American history of the Atlantic slave trade. He does not want these children to know the American history of the Trail of Tears. He does not want these children to know the American history of the, of the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. He does not want them to know the history of genocide as evidenced by William Patterson's book, we charge genocide. He doesn't want his little, fragile, innocent children to know the American history of the Tuskegee experiments and the eugenics movement in this country, as evidenced by Dr. Chantella Sherman's book, In Search of Purity, Popular Eugenics and the Racial Uplift of New Negroes, 1915 to 1935. Folks, we are at a very important inflection point here in America. We are experiencing a tremendous backlash by the racist reactionary elements in the American body politic. And a lot of that is attributable to the election of President Barack Hussein Obama. The Southern Poverty Law Center wrote, even as many celebrated, the election of America's first black president provoked a furious backlash from some angry whites. Governor DeSantis, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, and of course, Donald Trump. All examples of some of these angry white Americans. Vox wrote a piece about this wherein they said, Obama's election helped pave the way for Trumpism, not the idiosyncratic and often incomprehensible campaign of Donald Trump, but the anti-immigration, anti-trade, law and order populist movement that he has been able to bring back into the American body politic. One of the reasons Trumpism has uh, surprised political and media elites with its passion and strength is that it draws from an incredibly deep well of anxiety about America losing what it's perceived to be are its culture and its values in the face of, among other things, multiculturalism. And I'll add to this, in the foreign policy realm, it's a shift from a US-controlled unilateral world to a very dynamic multilateral world that the United States can no longer control. 
Vox continues, the idea that America is being both overrun and taken over by people with different values is partly inspired by reminders of the difference in everyday life that people are seeing play out right before their very eyes. Because you now walk in the streets and you see people who look like they're unauthorized aliens or immigrants. Uh, you now, if you wanna speak to someone on a, on a phone system for, uh, for some kind of help desk, please press one for English. But it's also reinforced by the media and by those uh, who represent America on the world stage. I said a few moments ago that we are at a very important inflection point in America. We are experiencing a tremendous backlash by the racist reactionary elements in the American body politic. The question before us now, the reason we are here for the next 24 hours with this teach-in for American democracy is because we are in the moment. We are experiencing a revolution in America and Dr. King in a phenomenal speech in 1966 told us, he warned us, don't sleep through the revolution. In that speech, he talked about Washington Irving's Rip Van Winkle. And Dr. King said, one of the things that we usually remember about the story of Rip Van Winkle is that he slept 20 years. But Dr. King points out, there is another point in that story that is usually overlooked. When Rip Van Winkle went up into the mountains above the Hudson for that long nap, the sign on the local inn had a picture of King George III of England. When he came down after his 20 years, the sign had a picture of George Washington. And the point in the story was that Rip Van Winkle slept through the revolution. Folks, in conclusion, Let me say, it's about keeping students ignorant of American history. So it'll be harder for them to grow into responsible Americans who understand humanity and will challenge the ignorance of racism and homophobia if the governor has his way. I submit to you tonight, we're in the midst of another American revolution. And this issue with the accurate teaching of American history and trying to write African Americans and others of color out of it, denying LGBTQ community their space in the dialogue, maybe, just maybe, if we don't talk about them, maybe they'll just walk away. Folks, don't sleep through the revolution. It is now truly my honor to present the man, the senior pastor of the Greater Mount Zion AME Church here in St. Petersburg, Florida. And someone I am truly honored to say, I'm, I'm probably the only Catholic with an AME pastor. <laughs> <laughs> pastor Clarence Williams. I don't know how I could follow that up. First of all, let me thank everybody for being here today. This is such a wonderful and diverse group. Uh, it reminds me of how much work we really have to do in this country, not only to, uh, to continue to sustain what we have as a viable and great nation. You know, I, I travel a lot and I've had the great privilege of traveling uh, many places in the world. And every time I come home, I understand in a new and very special way what it means when the guy says, welcome home. Uh, we live in the greatest country in the world. Uh, and I, I, you know, disagree with those that say, let's make America great again. America was great, is great, and will always be great. And I think as a nation, we understand that. 
And it is discouraging for me and disappointing in, in, in some sense for uh, me to have to see and, and filter calls, field calls and emails from colleagues that live in other states and other parts of the country, other parts of the world uh, about what's going on in Florida. It's, it's almost disheartening sometimes when uh, the people uh, look at CNN and, and, and draw this picture of Florida that reminds us of the Jim Crow era and all of the things that we want to forget in our society, in our world. Uh, but uh, our governor has some ambitions and he has a process, he has motives. Uh, he wants to be president of the United States. And in that, he's going to have to uh, get him a base. Uh, and uh, after this fight uh, between he and Trump as as to who will control uh, the, the uh, right, uh, the radical right. I believe that there are many wonderful Republicans in our country. Let's be clear. There are wonderful legislators that are fair. They mean what they do. They are serious about what they do. They don't have that tinge of racism in them. They are just policymakers that might disagree with the way Democrats make policy, but there are some values in America that everybody ought to agree on. One of them should be the fair and peaceful transition of power. That should be something that Democrats and Republicans agree on. But as a result of this, this mindset of hatred in our nation, the governor is smart enough to realize that there's a lot of hatred in Florida. There's a lot of hatred in America. And he wants to capitalize on that and make that that energizing force to get his base energized so that he can move forward in the fashion and in the method of his predecessor. I believe he's going to fail. One of the things that his uh, political pundits have not told him, and maybe the people around him maybe whispered it, you can't win the presidency in America without urban America. It's going to be very difficult for him to do that. And I think his policies, some of his statements, and many of his sentiments uh, are not going to land friendly on a population and a populace that he's going to desperately need if he's going to be elected president of this country. Uh, he's sharp in the sense that, you know, when we worked with him when, when he was in North Clearwater area, he was, a, he, he, he was a good guy. He helped us move some legislation through, and I don't remember what it was now. Uh, and, and, and we were proud of the work that he did. Uh, certainly his ideologies have changed, and he's moved in a different direction. You know, the governor understands that the crust of change in America has been wrought through the academic community. So... As a result of that, he feels that muddling that dynamic, that powerful force that was at the forefront of the civil rights movement, the forefront of voter rights, that dynamic is dangerous to him. So he wants to muzzle that academic community. And what we have in Florida and in other places is uh, this paralysis, this uncertainty. Uh, not only about equity, inclusion, and diversity, but paralysis as what they can teach and what they can't teach. I remember being a young man growing up in Polk County. They used to call it Imperial Polk County then. Uh, and, um, you know, we were, were forced to read these, quote, quote, American classics, Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, where it was the N-word this and the N-word that. And I protested about it and won. How does a Black child feel? Being in a class where every time that word comes across, one of the readers, the white kids giggle. It was horrible. They call it classics. I call it racism. Yet, instead of evaluating every literary work on the merits of what it can produce, not only on the paper, but in the minds of the reader, you want to call Toni Morrison and other people's books uh, racial uh, bait to make people hate. Well, I think hatred was in this country a long time before Toni Morrison and others whose works have been pulled off the shelves 
in some places, not to the degree that CNN has uh, uh, reported, but uh, matter of fact, here in Pinellas County, one particular book was pulled off and put back on the same day. And these are the sorts of things that we're gonna have to challenge, not only on the local level, but every other level as well. Uh, the governor has decided to attack the woke agenda, agenda in favor of what I call the sleep agenda. It never happened. It didn't happen. I don't remember that. I don't recall that. And it's sad, but it's true. And we have to understand this political machine for what it is. You know, politics is a process by which people uh, can make their own paradigms public policy. That's, that's, that's the beauty of, of, of politics. And certainly there are those uh, here today that believe that the DeSantis agenda, if given uh, uh, the, the opportunity, may gain traction nationwide. And these um, unheard of and, and quite frankly egregious methods of muzzling the education and academic community may become something that we see from coast to coast. I think that would be terrible. But what we have to do is to refocus and root, retool ourselves so that we are able to combat the governor and beat him at his own game. And we are proposing that we understand that we have resources that are untouchable by the governor. We have schools, we have educators. I know in my congregation, I have doctors, I have lawyers, I have PhDs, and everyone else that uh, have congregations have similar uh, resources in their own congregation. So we need to rethink and retool our own classrooms, rethink and retool our own resources so that we can teach the things that this particular governor does not want to be taught. It's one thing to be called to action. It's another thing to get activated and get in action. You know, I love talking. At least that's what they say. But I love doing better. Uh, I love my pulpit. I speak there every Sunday. There are two or three people that listen. <laughs> but this is better. Because I, I, I get an opportunity with colleagues like Clayton and Ken and, 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 and others to go out in this community and touch these kids see their plights and help them overcome. Not by filibustering, but filling their minds with education, with knowledge, strength, and giving them the spiritual wherewithal to understand that the battle does not stop. You know, one of my uh, comments I say to the young people is this, you know, I say, uh, there's a difference between losing and defeat. You see, one is just an obstacle on your way to victory. The other one means you gave up the quest. You waved the white flag. Um, we may lose some battles, but we're going to win the battle. You know, the governor, uh, he represents uh, a threat that is no worse than what we ever talked about. I've seen Strom Thurmond. I've seen... Uh, Harry T. Moore murdered on Christmas Day, president of NAACP in Florida, after the Groveland Folk, after he petitioned the governor to remove the sheriff that killed those boys. It's a book that everybody in Florida ought to read, The Devil in the Grove. It's, it's a book about Thurgood Marshall and how he cut his teeth during civil rights in Florida. And if you need a copy, I got one, I'll give you a copy. But... In that book, he talks about how this man and his family's house was bombed on Christmas Day, killing his family. I think his daughter survived, if I'm not mistaken. And when you think about the egregious nature of an act like that, what we're going through now is nothing but window dressing. So I would not be intimidated. I'm not afraid. I would not dwell in the spirit of fear. Matter of fact, a book that I read says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
for the love, sound mind. So let's become more than competent. Let's become capable to take on DeSantis and any other tyranny and egregious racism that comes in our country. God bless you. Stay on the battlefield. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Wow. Goodness. Thank you. So we I'm overwhelmed. And one of the things I want to say to the people out there, this is just a taste of what you will see. For the next 23 hours now almost, we will have people lecturing about history, talking about taking action. Dr. Leon and Pastor Williams have placed this in context for us to understand the gravity of the problem and also to say that we need to stay motivated and that we can make change. I know that we see something in the papers even today, different bills that are being signed different ways that people are being devalued and marginalized. And it feels overwhelming. But that's when we look to the past. That's when we look to the people like Pastor Williams is talking about, like Thurgood Marshall, like Ella Baker, like Septima Clark, like some of the people we're going to learn about. And we say that if they could get up and put one foot in front of the other each day and face the perilous acts that they faced, we can do this. We will not be stopped. So we're asking everybody there on Zoom, people here in the sanctuary to stay with us, to learn from the actions we can, we can, we're going to hear about this evening, to remain catalyzed and to know that we can and will create change. We will not be stopped by the perilous actions and legislation of Governor Ron DeSantis or Greg Abbott or anybody else. That's right. So we're going to give you specific ways to get involved. That's one thing that we do really well. Education, you're going to get a ton of it over the next 24 hours. Action is another necessary part. And at Common Power, there are plenty of ways for folks of all ages to take action. You're going to hear about some of that stuff tonight. Who else are we going to hear from though? We got some special guests from Florida. We have some other folks coming. Yep, and we'll give you a tip right now. If you want to let us know that you're with us, do some actions right now just to let us know that you're engaged. If you're on social media, send that tweet. Uh, hit us up on Instagram at the Institute for Common Power, on LinkedIn, wherever you are. If you really want to take some action, let us know you're with us following the spirit of pastor, go out and buy one of them banned books, go on Amazon and let's, let's blow Tony Morrison up. Yes. Um, let, let's blow some of the other authors who found themselves, uh, 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 academics and others on the other side of this effort to ban our history and literature in a way that affirms that that literature, that history is important. And last but not least, share. Let people know what's going on tonight. We're going to be here for 24 hours. Hassan Jeffries will be here. Kara Sonia Whitehead will be here. Ivory Tolson will be here. There'll be some incredible folks that will be joining us. So spread the word. Right now, we're going to kick it out to David uh, and uh, Jordan, and they're going to share some details. And we'll be back with you here in Florida in just a few minutes. And you'll see David and Jordan over the next 24 hours. They will be our virtual hosts. They're joining us from Phoenix and Seattle. We have people all over the country joining in this effort. And we are proud to be here in St. Petersburg, Florida today. Just getting started, y'all. Let's go. Yep.